but here we've been able to customize it for the use for MLN surveillance. Now, just as a way of introduction, uh, we do pest surveys because we want to determine maybe the, the presence of the pest. So the differences, and I really wanted to give that information because sometimes people confuse those ones. So uh, for West African region, I've just mentioned that uh, this will be purely the pest detection uh, surveys. So in a nutshell, you will just want to know the purpose of uh, the survey and also what are the particular methods that you can be able to use in this survey, I mean, in these survey activities. Now, surveys can be triggered by pest pathway analysis, and this can be done through pest risk analysis. I think we talked this yesterday in the quarantine group. So for the survey tools that we are using uh, in MLN, most of them are digital-based uh, techniques, but we have got also options that you can be able to use manual forms, where you design a checklist, and then you use a normal GPS uh, equipment, and then you can be able to track uh, your surveillance activities in the area. But in this particular presentation, I will focus mostly on the use of the digital tools available, which is the electronic survey tool uh, that is, is an open uh, data kit that is um, available on any Android-based uh, uh, electronic gadget. So just to give an overview of uh, maybe what can entail a manual process, you can be able to de develop a checklist, which is a form, and then you have the GPS um, uh, equipment. And you can do this because um, in MLN surveys, we do categorize them in three because of the different conditions that are available there. Uh, so we do uh, one for the seed fields, farmers, I mean farmers' fields, then seed fields, and then agro dealers, those ones who are selling the seed. And we have got all those different parameters we want to capture uh, during the survey process. So this is just a typical uh, type of form that you can be able to develop having all the information you want to capture during the survey process. So the difference between what I've just mentioned and this one is because you can be able to come up with a clear electronic survey form, I mean the form, then you upload it into the ODK tool. So the, the difference is that you upload this form now into the electronic app. So the beauty of this is that all the information you are gathering during the survey will be captured real time. So what we are talking about is that if you are talking about the date of planting, the area where you are, the type of uh, crop, the, 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 the crop size, things of that kind, will be captured and they can be relayed to a server which is linked to the app in real time. So you don't need to be able to continue uh, keeping those forms together and maybe they can be interfered with during the time of the, the survey. Sometimes you can be take maybe three or four days in the field and there are chances that this uh, information can be interfered with. But in this case, the information is very safe because it is delayed, I mean, it is uh, relayed in real time to our servers. Uh, this particular slide shows a little bit in detail how this electro electronic form looks like. But what is important is that uh, you can be able to customize these forms as per the country. So if it is Nigeria or Ghana, you can do that. And then it will be able to take the information depending on how you are getting it in the field. But you need a little bit of training to the surveillance team to be able to utilize this particular application. The beauty of this particular uh, form, which is electronic, is that when you enter the date, 
I mean, you cannot be able to manipulate the date and the time. So, which means that when you are doing that particular activity in the field, it will just take the date which is, of course, being displayed on the gadget, if it's the phone or the tablet. Because in my experience with the surveillance, sometimes when you send out teams to do surveillance in the field, they may just maybe just look around like two fields, then they cross the day's work and come home. Hmm? And then they can be able to manipulate the forms maybe in their, in their office and tell you they have been able to survey more than 50 farms. But with this particular application, you won't be able to do that. Because unless you actually fed that information in the app, it won't be able to record. And if you are the one managing this data, you can actually monitor your surveillance team in the field when you are in the office. So they won't be able to tell you that you've been able to do this, how we did this. You can easily just monitor them in real time. So that's the beauty of this particular tool. Uh, another thing is that uh, the tool also interacts with other Android-based apps, which are already in the phone or in the tablet. For example, the, scan, the scanner, you can be able to download the, uh, the, the barcode scanner, which will be used to identify the sample. So that means that you can be able to track that sample until at the end of the process, maybe testing it or something like that, which is very good for uh, data analysis. Uh, another uh, app that is very important is the GPS, because normally when we are doing the, um, uh, the normal way of uh, surveillance is where you are using the phone and the GPS equipment. But in this case, because most of the Android Best uh, uh, gadgets have got GPS inside, so that GPS interacts very well with the ODK tool. So that means when you reach at a place where you want to get the GPS of the area, it automatically gives you that and it's taken in immediately. So that means that the ability of this ODK to interact with other apps on the on the Android um, based uh, equipment is very good and that means it is very versatile. So this is what just I've mentioned about the uh, QR code. We want to see how we can be able to give a sample the identity. So we generate these particular codes, which can be done using different softwares, and these ones can be used now to be able to identify the sample. And this is very good because you will not be able to miss out the sample that you are able to collect in the field. So basically that's what happens, but the most important thing is that um, you need also to have a very versatile way of testing for the target organism that you are doing in the surveillance. So for the case of MLN, we've been able to uh, optimize the immunostrip and the one that we are using mostly in our surveillance programs is AgriStrip from BioReba. And I think Dr. Suresh has done quite a lot of uh, work there. We've been able to optimize this particular uh, protocol for testing. And you can be able to test for six samples using one immunostrip. And that makes it to be very cost effective because if you are to take like one strip for only one sample, then definitely that will be like a little bit expensive for any normal surveillance. But if you can be able to use one strip for six samples within a surveillance program in the field, that is very cost effective. Because the essence here for surveillance is you just want to see if the disease is there or not. Now, if it's for a detection type of survey, for the case like, for example, for West African region, when you test a positive using the agri strip, you need to do a confirmatory test using a more superior either serological or molecular based technique, just to be able to be sure that actually it is MCMV you've been able to detect in the field. So that is indeed very important. So I've just said that we have been able to optimize the, the protocol for immunostrip. And uh, the first thing we do is to train the surveillance teams uh, we take them through 
the ODK uh, app, how you can be able to upload your form. We actually we do upload the forms for them, but how you can be able to use the tool, and exactly how you can be able to carry out that simple test when you are in the field. Because in the surveillance form, we also have the last bit is to tell us whether it is the sample is positive for MCMV or it is negative. So that means that the diagnostic bit goes hand in hand with the surveillance uh, protocol. So this particular slide simply shows you how you can quickly do the sampling in the field and how you can be able to store the sample for further analysis in the lab. As you can see, those bag bags there, they have the QR barcodes, which ac actually identifies the sample. So this slide shows some of the trainings we, we carry out for the MLN surveillance uh, teams, how to prepare the sample, which uh, we didn't have, maybe we didn't cut them, but I think you can be shown maybe in the lab what it's a simple process. Yes, you'll show this in the afternoon. And then you simply put in your immunostrip into the sap which has been uh, extracted by the buffer. And it takes between five to 10 minutes, then you'll be able to see uh, the bands. And this is very simple, and it is field deployable, and it takes a short time. Uh, the way we interpret the results is that if you have got the two bands, that shows that that particular sample is positive for MCMV. So if it's just one clear band, shows that that sample is negative for MCMV. And if it doesn't, any show, if it doesn't show any bands, that shows that that particular sample is invalid, or that test is invalid. So you may need to repeat the test. So these are some of the scenes that uh, we've, been, we've been having in the field especially where we do continuous surveillance for MLN. But there's something that I mentioned which is very important. After you've been able to fill uh, the surveillance form on the ODK app, where does that data go? We have developed what we call an MLN toolbox that can be able to receive all the data from all our surveillance teams in the field. So this particular tool is only for our own internal use. It is not for everybody. So it's only used by the surveillance teams. But we have only given some access to each particular member, I mean to the lead member of each team in each country. You can be able to log in and then you can be able to see your data. All the surveillance points will be there for you and you can be able to analyze that data. For example, you want to get the incidence of the disease, the prevalence of the disease, how severe were the symptoms. You took even some photos, those photos will be there. All manner of information will be there and you can be able to analyze that data in the MLN toolbox. This particular slide just goes a step further to see how you can be able to analyze that data and we are saying that it will be able to give you, even you can generate the, the surveillance data, either in tabular form, or if you want to publish a map, it will also be there. Depending on how best you want to represent your data that has come out from the surveillance activity, this tool will be able to help you to analyze the data. Now, once that data has been analyzed, it can now be published. What we mean by publishing is that this information now will be available for the public to access the data. Now, we've made it in such a way that the MLN toolbox is accessible to the MLN web portal, which we explained yesterday. So once the maps and the data has been published, now it will be available for public consumption on the MLN web portal. So I really strongly encourage you, you can still log on on the MLN web portal, which is mln.cimit.org. You will get 
the recent data and even the surveillance maps that has come from our surveillance activities in the region. So this is just an example of how it looks like. Like for example, if you see this map is for, uh, for Zambia and Zimbabwe, you can be able to see the published data. So those green dots show that um, the areas which were surveyed are still negative for MCMV, uh, which is good for us as a project because we want to keep MLN out of those countries. And this is for Malawi. It is still also having not any cases of uh, MCMV and by extension MLN. These are recent surveillance maps. In fact, they were just released like uh, two weeks ago uh, from our surveillance activities in those countries. Now, this map shows the region where we are working. Uh, you can see in Ethiopia, they are blue because the activity is still ongoing there. But after two weeks, they will be able to upload the positives and negatives. And you'll be able to see also there where MLN is, which is denoted by the red dots. And the green dots shows that MLN is absent in those surveillance points. So I said earlier that um, during the surveillance process, you can be able to collect as much information as possible, and you can also analyze that information and publish it. So this is just an example of, for example, if you want to know the sources of the seed that the farmers planted, like for example for Malawi here, it shows very clearly that 23% of the seed was purchased, 8% is others, we don't know where it came from, but the bulk, which is around 63%, is from farmers' seed. So this information can also be captured during the surveillance, which is very good. And you can analyze it in the MLN toolbox. You come up with these pie charts, which is very clear. So I think that is all uh, that I wanted to pass through in this particular presentation. Thank you. Any couple of questions or comments? Yes, hello. Thank you so much for that presentation. Yeah. My question is on uh, the aspects where I have to fill in information on the maybe the maybe the cropping history of the farm surveyed. Yeah. The types of varieties and some other things. Suppose you go to the field and the farmer is not there. How do you get such information in order to make a complete report? Thank you. Yeah, so it will be the discretion of you as a, a member of the surveillance team to choose a farm where you'll be able to get the information because most of the information you have to get it from the farmer, but some of the information you can get it in the field. So it will be very much advisable that you do that, especially we, 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 we advocate for you to visit the farm where the farmer himself is that will be more appropriate? Yes. You said something about using a strip. Yeah. For six um, different um, samples. Yeah. I don't understand because you know once you use the strip, the negative, uh, the positive shows, mm. and how do you reuse that? No, you don't reuse the strip once you've used it. It's just used once. Oh, okay. Maybe you lot. Do you lot? Huh? Do you lot six samples into one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a good question. So we say that uh, <clears throat> during the, uh, the the surveillance process, you'll be picking out the leaves from the plants that you suspect maybe they have the symptoms. Then we cut out small pieces of each. Or you'll cover it. I think he will cover it in a, in a detailed way. But what we say is that you pull out, you pull up six samples to represent one sample, one composite sample. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh no, you don't. You don't reuse it concurrently, but you pull the sample, six of them. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. 
Please, sir. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. Yeah, the question I want to ask is, uh, what will be the interval of this surveillance in a year? Because uh, this disease keeps on moving, or in, a, in the next two years or so, what will be the recommended recommendation for surveillance yes. so that we really know this disease where they are not is not moving from there, or they are moving further? Thank yeah, you. yeah, that's also a very good question. We recommend a frequency of one surveillance per year because surveillance is also expensive. It's not cheap because you are also crisscrossing the entire country. You need different uh, uh, reagents and uh, equipment and uh, whatever, transport. So we recommend that. And that is a representative because in every year you can be able to have complete sets of data and you can compare that uh, to see if this disease is spreading or not. In fact, people who do modeling, sometimes they use the historical data that has been accumulated over years. And this can help them to generate even signals to see if the disease is spreading and how is it, how fast is it spreading. So we recommend yearly is, is better. Especially where you have like one cropping season or, or even if there are two cropping seasons, you can still do that. Yeah. Please, in doing the survey, do you have major distances you have to cover? And based on the size of the farms, do you have the number of samples you have to collect uh, from the farm in the analysis? Oh, yeah. Um, I avoided that because that will be like a, a real training on real surveillance activities because it's quite elaborate how you crisscross the farm how many samples do you collect within the farm? What is the representative sample? I think that can be like a detailed explanation of how you carry out surveillance. But basically, that information is available. Yeah, I can share it with you one to one. Last question. These are these six samples that you lump coming from the same field or different field? What? The six samples. You oh, yeah. One yeah. Field. yeah, they, they come from one field. You know, because you really want to get the representative sample for, for that particular field. It will be outrageous if you only take one sample in a field and you test it. So if you do like six of them and you've dis defined like a transect where you are passing through and collecting those samples, and of course you are also uh, looking in, into um, trying to use the symptomatic expression of the disease, that will determine how you are doing the sampling that will be a little bit representative, but you can do more depending on the, on the size of the field. And to add to Francis' uh, remarks uh, that, especially in non-endemic countries, once you find a plot having MCMV, then the step will not end there. Then you, if it is identified as a positive, then you take the same set of sample to the recognized NPPO lab or any other authorized lab which you will be doing ELISA. Yeah, for but confirmatory test. And the same people can take one more time so that make sure that whatever the sample through GPRS is clarified and confirmed and, and conveyed. Thank you okay. much, Francis. OK. Uh, the next presenter is uh, Peg. Uh, while Peggy is coming, like just to add a comment um, on this surveillance tools. In Nigeria, we have uh, crop disease surveillance for our national Nigerian Agriculture Quarantine Services, and this is a piloting stage is ongoing, and uh, they're going to have a digital surveillance lab. And the advantage of this program that has been established is that it is non-crop specific; it covers all crops and diseases, and it can be tailored. So that's another development uh, based on the ICT technologies happening in the country. So Dr. Peck is from USDA, ARS, Ohio, Worcester. Um, she's a molecular geneticist, molecular biologist, and also a virologist. She's going to talk about the modeling for MLN work, which is hot of the press. This work was just published in Phytopathology. Yeah, and um, 
and the uh, the paper is I'm pretty sure open access, so um, I think you can go in and download it from Phytopathology if I pique your interest. Um, one of the things that I wanted to start with is this is a whole gang of people that did this uh, research, um, but two people in particular did uh, the lion's share of the work on the modeling side, and that's Frank Hilker and Nick Cun Cuniff, um, and also some people that um, contributed greatly were um, Versali, Karen, and Megan. Everybody did stuff, but those people did a lot of work. <laughs> Okay, and where are we from? We're from all over the place. Um, and this was actually for me one of the, a very interesting um, prospect because we did all of our meeting over um, an electronic platform called Zoom that let us sh share screens and whiteboards and uh, see each other while we were talking to each other. And, and basically we wrote the whole paper electronically. Um, now everybody's told you about MLN today and, and what's going on with it. Well, two summers ago, or 2016, I was giving a talk at the American Phytopathological Society meeting talking about the emergence of MLN in Africa um, and said many of the same things you've heard today. And so after I gave my talk, Nick and Karen came up to me and said, hey, do you want to try to model <laughs> MLN um, uh, in the field in, in East Africa? And I'm like, not me. <laughs> I can't do that. I'm not, you know, I, don't, I can't do math. Um, but they convinced me that modeling is beneficial. And in particular, um, Nick gave a talk, and it was on the emergence of a, a tree pathogen, a fungal pathogen in California. And their modeling showed that they could completely quell the disease by eradicating all of the trees of that species within, let's say, a kilometer. That's a big, that's a big circle. And, and expensive, right? But they also showed that if they didn't go that far with eradicating the trees, that the disease would reemerge. Okay? And in this particular case, they ended up with evidence saying that the way the model predicted worked, and if you didn't take out enough trees, if your circle wasn't a kilometer, you had reemergence. And that's kind of what I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll work with these guys. Um, and so modeling disease development can identify the most likely ways to control spread. Um, and that gives us better ways to use always limited resources. And then one other reason, thing is, is that by modeling the effects of, let's say, certain kinds of um, agronomic control of disease, um, we can tell which ones might be the most likely to help us. Okay, so those are all good things about modeling. Now, it looks like I've spelled modeling two different ways and very randomly. Um, modeling is dangerous from my point of view. It's an imperfect science. Okay, in this particular group, I was the biologist with 14 mathematicians. <laughs> and, you know, we would talk about how things went, they'd give me a model and I'd say, that can't be right, we know that doesn't happen, right? I mean, that can't happen biologically, what you're, what you're trying to say, and they would go back and they would change it, hand it to me again. One of the things is that mo the modeling relies on current knowledge. And for MLN, as we started talking about the disease and what we knew about it, you could see really big gaps in what we knew. And so you know that the model is going to be limited in those areas. And what that leads to is that bad information 
gives you a bad model and bad recommendations. So you have to always keep that in mind. So as we started to develop the model, uh, we decided to use um, the, the format of that maize is grown on in the Rift Valley of Kenya because that was what I was most familiar with. And there, there's two seasons for growing maize. One, they call them there the short and the long rains. Okay, and we decided we would have two kinds of farmers because that's what they have. So we have larger farmers, which are relatively research, resource rich, uh, fairly large holdings. These guys, these folks can afford certified clean hybrid seed. They can afford chemical sprays. They could use crop rotation, all of those things for disease control. All right, and then with the other scenario, part of the scenario would be small farmers, resource poor smallholder farmers um, who are unlikely to be able to really afford chemical control of vectors. Um, and their primary tools would be roguing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, that's where if I see a sick plant, I just I remove it from my field. Um, and crop rotation would be available to those guys for disease control. One more important thing to keep in mind is that the plot size that's used in the model depends on the kind of farmer. And so the small plots that these small farmers have are going to be more affected by exogenous factors than large plots because the ratio of the perimeter to the interior is bigger, right? All right, and Monica showed this before. And, and so this is, we tried to list all the things that could affect the development of MLN um, within the field and between fields. Um, what kinds of things, so what kinds of management practices um, are important for within field um, spread, um, including roguing, rotation, pesticides, um, certified seed and resistance. And then I'm going to, those things are all uh, controlling spread within the field. And for the model, we're ignoring resistance for the time being. Um, and then what factors affect um, management in neighboring fields, so inoculum moving from one field to another. Um, and then we talked about what might um, regulate the amount of virus uh, that comes in between seasons. And so in, th in that case, the factors that affect that are vertical transmission of the viruses, which I'll sometimes say, and that really means seed transmission. So a seed from an infected plant produces another infected plant, and that's called vertical transmission in plant pathology. Um, soil transmission of one or both viruses um, and uh, the presence of vectors. We then divided all of those things into more into components that could be defined mathematically. Okay, um, so for example, for certified clean seed, we could say a large holder farmer would be able to plant certified seed, and we would assume that was a hundred percent free of viruses, and and that's an assumption. <laughs> Or we could say the smallholder farmer um, couldn't um, affect, uh, afford certified seeds. They, the rate of seed transmission for them would then depend on the amount of disease there was in the previous season uh, because they're using their own seed again. Um, or we could put it somewhere in between there. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because I get over my head really fast on this. But the basic model, okay, is we take information that we can put together on virus transmission from seed, 
virus transmission from infested soil to new plants. Transmission from exogenous sources into my field and transmission from vectors within my field. Okay, those and, and those go into, and I, I on purpose made that black because to me it's a black box that's full of many equations that are all in the paper. Um, and that gives us an idea of the multi-seasonal changes that you see in the amount of MCMV and SCMV infection you actually see in the field. Okay, so that looks pretty easy and clean, doesn't it? But when we start to look at what makes up each of those four components, you can see we have to keep breaking it down because um, the source of, uh, so a plant could be infected with MCMV alone, it could be infected with SCMV alone, it could be infected with both viruses. So we have to take those into account. They might act differently, right? Um, we have sources of MCMV from within the field and SCMV from within the field. Those could be different. Those could be affected by whether or not both viruses are in the plant or not. So starting to tease apart each of these factors into all of the things that control it is, is really what modelers do. And then what they were asking me is, what do you know about this rate? What information do you already have? And so, and then because that forms the basis of a bunch of assumptions, right? We have to, we have to start somewhere. We have to say, okay, we're, we're going to agree that we know this whether we actually know it or not, okay? And one of the big ones that we started with was that the transmission of each virus, MCMV and SCMV, was independent of host infection by the other virus. Huh. It, it, and I always, so that means that if I have both virus, if I have a plant infected with MCMV and a plant infected with MCMV plus SCMV, the rate of transmission of MCMV is the same from both those plants. And it turns out, for reasons that mathematically I can't explain to you right now, but could before, um, that it does look like that's true from a set of data that we had on, on the presence of MCMV and SCMV alone and together in plants from Kenya, that this straight line here Okay, between the percent MLN, so doubly infected plants, uh, relative to the singly infected plant, total of the singly infected plants is linear and, it is a, and it has a 45 degree angle. That suggests that indeed uh, transmission is independent. Oops, sorry. Um, as I mentioned before, infection from exogenous sources depends on field size. Um, that certified seed was free of both viruses. One big one is that rotation or fallow for a season re reduces the level of soil inoculum to zero. And we don't have a lot of data on that, but that was where we started. Um, that within field virus transmission is the same during the short and long rain seasons. Um, and for, and we said that no disease management includes not using clean seed. Okay, I mentioned that before. And that virus transmission through seeds not affected by co-infection of the plants. Okay. All right, that's good. I don't have to do any like these scenarios because I, <laughs> all right. And then I, I wanted to put up, these are the things that we're, you're going to see later. The baseline is using the default parameters. Co-infection means what's the difference between a doubly infected plant and singly infected plants. Exogenous effect is virus coming from the outside. MCMV invading means SCMV is there at equilibrium and MCMV is coming in. That's the initial disease emergence. 
Um, both viruses endemic means there's a certain level of virus present for both of them. And both of them falling is what would happen, is if you envision it's what happens right after we do a lot of control. Both virus concentration, both viruses falls. Skip that. Okay. So this is the initial prediction of virus prevalence. These are all um, with a small farmer um, scenario. And we see that, so this is M SCMV endemic, that means it stays the same. Um, MCMV is invading, it's increasing, but it, it comes up and then it comes to its own equilibrium level. Um, and therefore MLN does the same thing. One interesting thing is that happens fairly quickly. Within a few years, it looks like that's, you have a stable level of virus in your environment, okay? After disease management, we do see drops in the, uh, uh, in the prevalence of each virus in MLN, but that too quickly levels off at a new uh, equilibrium. One of the things that was interesting is that crop rotation dropped the prevalence of viruses very strongly in this model. Okay, one thing that I need to remember to tell you is that um, if you look on the no control side, there are two points per year. And if you look on the uh, rotation, there's only one point per year. And that's because there's only one maize crop per year if you're rotating. In, the, in this agricultural system. Um, <clears throat> we saw that there was um, good effects of, first of all, of rotation. So this is no control and this is rotation. So you have more plants standing, which is a proxy for yield in this model. You have more plants standing if you rotate your crops. Um, Co-infection um, doesn't change what's going on here very much, which is, I, I think it fits everything else that we've seen. Um, and if, I'm not sure, that's not here. I don't have it, I'm, I, I'm not showing it, but if you have, a, in this case, if you have a lot of virus coming in from outside, of your field that overwhelms your control, your disease control. Um, that, so what we saw for STAN, we also see for the prevalence of virus, and that is that uh, rotation really reduces the prevalence of virus, both for small farmers and, and large farmers, um, but that a lot of virus coming in from outside of the field kind of overwhelms your control. All right, and I'm gonna skip that because I've got five minutes. So, <laughs> um, a couple of other things that, uh, just a few other things that they know, we noted from the model that I'm not gonna show you the data on. If both viruses are there, and we change that co-infection increases vertical virus transmission, the viruses per persist no matter what kind of control we have. I'm not sure what that means, but practically what that means is there's no eliminating MCMV. Um, exogenous infection um, means that both viruses will always be able to invade and start a new um, of a set of infection, new epidemic. Uh, reducing soil and vector transmission greatly reduces MCMV and therefore MLN. And as I said before, exogenous transmission can overwhelm everything else um, that you see. And I'm going to say this suggests this effect of exogenous virus coming in from outside suggests the real importance of landscape-wide control measures, right? That I, as an, a single farmer, am not gonna be effective if I, if I don't get with everybody else around me. And um, so the model predicts that, but um, previous results from Hawaii also suggest that, and that is the, the seed companies in Hawaii do control MLM by having 
or MCMV by having an MCMV free period imposed on this area where they all have plots. And they have found that if they have a company or a farmer who decides to grow corn during that MCMV free period, it wrecks things for everybody. So much so that if a farmer is growing corn during their MCMV free period, they will go buy his corn and plow it under so that they can maintain their, their MCMV free period, or their maize free period. So what, 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 you know, what's the good of this? One thing is, is that is really positive. It suggests we can control MLN under a wide range of conditions. Um, and that crop rotation may be among the most effective controls, but it must be practiced on a landscape um, wide um, system. Um, Another issue here is that appropriate rotation crops, cropping systems for those crops, markets, and farmer education and support have to be available if you're going to get people to buy into this kind of control. And this, I, I think that maybe this should be a priority uh, for research in endemic areas where, where MLN already, all, already is and then things to be thinking about if you're somewhere lucky enough to currently be free of this disease. Um, another is that the co-infection, if, if co-infection increases vertical transmission, which we know nothing about at this moment, <laughs> causes higher and longer persistence of MLN viruses, then we really do need to define the rates of uh, vertical transmission in singly infected and doubly infected plants so that we have a good idea of what we're facing there. And I think with that, I will say thank you and try my best to answer questions. <laughs> Any questions or clarifications? Would everybody sleep? Yes, Monica. It's more a comment than a question. Uh, I think that at the end, modeling is good, it's not. <laughs> because, the, first of all, all the analysis that was done to understand all the factors that are influencing the management of MLN is really very good in this paper. And I think that this type of analysis can be used anywhere. So it gives really a very good instrument, and I hope that we can uh, implement it uh, both in Kenya and the countries where MLN is present, but also where it is not yet. I, I, I agree. I think one of the things it did for me was point up the areas, like you said, where we don't have enough information because I couldn't answer questions, right? Um, and the other thing about the model that I didn't mention is that you can always build and make it more complicated. Right, but you have to start somewhere with it. Yeah. Last question, Jude. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, hello. I want to know how many years did you collect the information that you use in this? Um... So the data that we used to build the model actually came from anywhere that there was data wow. available. And so, in fact, a lot of the data that we use came from the U.S. Midwest because there's, there's published information that gave us an idea of, of what those rates were. For example, how much time the virus might be resident in the soil okay. came from a paper from back in the 80s from Kansas, and we just picked that. But, but that pointed out to me that, that there was a big gap in okay. the knowledge that we have. Okay. Okay. I, I, you said something about concerning one of the assumptions. Infection from mesogenous sources, you know, depends on feed size. Yeah. Um, it means that, and you said that the small audience are more vulnerable. Yeah. So doesn't that mean that the bigger the field, then the more the the risk? Um. So more more of a big field is far away from the edge than a small field and that's what that's why that's that way okay <laughs> okay i think uh
Thank you, Peg. All right, thanks. Yeah. And now I invite Suresh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Still, good morning to all of you, and uh, I'm really happy to share some of the aspects on producing disease-free seeds. Uh, especially in relevance to MLN. Uh, we all know that the uh, challenge of MLN is, is in Eastern Africa, but most threat is lies, still lies in these non-endemic countries, meaning that means any time we are vulnerable because it can be coming here, not because uh, pathogen is coming, because of varieties uh, grown here are not specifically bred for MLN diseases. That means it can, it can be very vulnerable and also vector populations, it also uh, for a continuous cropping pattern. So we have to be very careful in adopting several steps to produce disease-free seeds. I think that makes more important because we feed a, a larger population with maize. It goes from every family and at every different growing uh, stage. So, as I think, uh, we, I will not cover much uh, on the 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 pathogen side and the uh, distribution side, but there are uh, some information still I would like to cover upon here. Uh, if you see here, uh, as uh, MCMB or MLN has started 1973, even it has uh, you know. Uh, gone to uh, Spain in 2016. That means the indication is there, it is almost uh, traveling all through the world, but it's still, you know, just uh, as a matter of time, it can go to anywhere. Uh, but only we have to take care uh, through our disciplined seed movement, and also we have to adopt best agronomic practices to control the diseases. Uh, and, you know, if you see here, and all like the Spain is, is uh, and then the seed movement can take place any time here. But we have to adapt with the strict uh, regulatory practices not to take any uh, seeds from here. So especially in this uh, uh, producing uh, disease-free seeds, uh, I, I would say there are uh, one thumb rule you have to adopt. One, what is a thumb rule? Thumb rule is don't accept the bad seeds. Means don't accept the disease seeds. Don't keep the disease seeds in your farm. Don't deliver the disease seeds to any other neighbors. So that is the thumb rule. If you adapt that one, I think you are successful in growing maize crop uh, without any challenge of MLN or any other disease in general. So, 
So I think uh, I will not cover as uh, Dr. Prasanna and uh, Monica and, uh, and the Lava has extensively covered on occurrence and distribution of um, CMV and MLN and also on the, uh, the epidemiology of MLN. Uh, but basically, uh, I will touch base a little bit more on, uh, on the disease triangle. Yeah. 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 Uh, so as I will uh, straightly go into the seed production issues uh, uh, in that uh, respect, um, especially you know MLN is is, is more devastating as the person has mentioned here that uh, MCME because MCME new to the region because we have seen some of the experiments that when we have SCME in the plant and when we have uh, MCME inoculated the challenge of MLN is more higher. Yeah? If, if the plant is having MCME first and then it's challenge with the SCME, the incidence is slightly lesser. But that means uh, if you have the SCME in the region uh, and then if you get uh, MCME in the later, it, the challenge will be more higher. So we have to check the MCME in particular. And also with the understanding of uh, 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 the occurrence and distribution with the USAID project, and we have seen that uh, uh, the for MCMV and MLN is reported in several parts, parts of Eastern Africa. It started with uh, Kenya and also it started with uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, uh, South Sudan, DRC and, and, and several other Eastern African regions. So this which you all know that how fast it has taken coverage in Eastern Africa. So for any uh, production of disease free seeds you have to have a three components understanding. One is understanding the disease symptoms yeah? and second is uh, disease diagnosis which I will not uh, focus on because LAVA has covered majority of the symptoms and as well as Monica has also covered on the disease diagnosis and Francis Matoni also covered. So this leaflet has been distributed in all your folders, please refer. This could be one of the simple uh, take home message where you can understand the uh, disease symptoms very easily. So. So most of us, we understand that uh, the disease symptoms is only when uh, uh, it is at the complete uh, necrotic stage, but it is not so. So we have to carefully understand the disease symptoms at early stages uh, with SCMV and MCMV uh, with the distinct symptoms. But it is difficult uh, because uh, often uh, based on the genotype, based on the environment, based on the uh, crop uh, stages, the symptoms could vary. And also we have to be very careful that is only possible with uh, accurate diagnosis uh, which can be done easily at a farm using immunostrips or carefully at a uh, laboratory using ELISA method. So most often we may ignore the uh, symptoms at uh, early stages but if you carefully see the symptoms, if you see the symptoms here uh, and, and we have to carefully understand mild mosaic and modeling. That is the stage at which we have to uh, scout the uh, plants and, and uh, rogue out the plants. Before roguing out, we have to uh, <coughs> spray the insecticides and especially we have to spray the insecticides either in the morning or in the evening. Do not disturb the plants so that we check the vectors uh, be before it goes to any other non-infected plants. And likewise, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the, we, we keep seeing these symptoms but it's too late to uh, see the symptoms uh, and, and uh, rogue the plants. So we had to rogue out the plants at early stages. And likewise, it has different uh, type of symptoms based on the genotypes as well as uh, uh, varieties, I mean, of course, uh, the growing stages. So this is a dead heart symptoms. This will be too late to uh, um, uh, keep the plants. So we have to rogue out at early stages. As we mentioned, uh, the diagnosis uh, of using uh, immunostrips, you know, like uh, here we have uh, a simple method. Uh, we, we, we see this uh, uh, leaf uh, collected from the uh, one plot of six plants, and especially as Monica mentioned, with the proper, uh, you know, like method uh, using zigzag or different approaches. And we collect six plants, uh, suspected plants, and using a small coin size leaf, and we put in the pouches. So then you use the given buffer, we extract a, a, a sap and put that one drop of uh, the, the sap in with the three drop of buffer 
and within five, 15 minutes we can get to know the presence or absence of virus. And if the, there is a two band, it is the presence of virus. If it is one band, there is no virus. If there is no band at all, and uh, there is the invalid uh, result. Based on this, we can easily detect at the field. So that means it is very important and the uh, field level to diagnose. So most management practices, we all know that uh, on the uh, simple step of uh, avoidance, exclusion, eradication and protections. Based on this, we have devised uh, you know, simple method uh, as a checklist uh, for producing disease-free things. So in this case, uh, first is avoidance, you know, like uh, first of all, uh, I would suggest if, if the farmer or if you are uh, going to the field which you have already visited any field, so do not visit the field which you have, if you have already visited the maize field. Means you may carry unknowingly uh, any vectors or inoculum uh, from the in, uh, infected plots to healthy plots. That means that is the first step uh, we have to take care. And second, many times people often, they, when they rub out the infected plants, they do uh, feed into animals. That is also not advisable. So that is the second step you, you have to uh, take care. The third step is most important, critical here is that keep all your tools, implements, tractors and anything that you used in the farming should be clean and disinfected. That is the primary source of contaminations anytime, whenever you are handling it that should be uh, properly cleaned and disinfected and it should not be ignored. And, and likewise, the most, uh, another important step is the community of practice. What we are listening today, likewise, if you have similar steps in your villages or a farm or uh, any communities, I mean monthly or once in a season, you understand the problems, concerns, bring the issues, discuss and there are some experts are available in the counties or in the states or anywhere. So you ex exchange the information, exchange the knowledge, exchange the difficulties and, and get into the practical solutions and not just the theoretical uh, uh, and implement every step into a you know, practical approach uh, that is easy for you to control the diseases. Most important, as yesterday we were discussing, uh, you know, like uh, studying on the environment, first anything which starts with a seed, don't bring any seeds which you are in doubt. Don't accept the seed which it is grown in the farm and, and you know like uh, do not grow the seeds just because of uh, you have to, you are get, not getting the seeds. Better you have to uh, take care of the seeds. And second is that I know like uh, you should not use any MCME as uh, suspected uh, seeds from the MCME infected plants. And here you can see here that the most important that uh, the roguing or weeding is most in critical. Suppose if you see that here, the plants which is in the border, it may, uh, may not have the virus, you know, you may not recognize it. But uh, especially vector doesn't recognize when it comes from the different uh, dist uh, distant places. So it will automatically take the virus inoculum and enter into the maize field. So here, uh, and automatically it spreads uh, by itself. So if you don't have any, uh, you know, like uh, the, the plant which is surrounding to uh, the maize plot and it is clean and then the vector has no chance to bring the inoculum to the maize field. So that, that is the most important uh, that step you have to have a clean uh, um, field surrounding to the maize crop. And second you have to take care of the weeding uh, in the regular cropping period. So that is also an important step for taking care of the uh, the inoculum load in the field. As, ma as uh, uh, Pat has mentioned that with her uh, good research background and then also uh, uh, yesterday, you know, like uh, uh, we discussed. So uh, having, uh, you know, maize free period is most critical. As I was uh, dis uh, visiting Rwanda, maize free period not just in the field alone. Uh, in Rwanda, it's one of the uh, serious issues is that they do not have any maize uh, in the, in the uh, main summer seasons. But there are many farmers, they do grow small amount of maize in the backyards. That itself is sufficient to host, uh, provide as a source of inoculum. 
even to that extent we had to take care and that means it is a, a giant responsibility of you know small holder farmers or regulators to check that kind of availability of host to the pathogens even in the absence of main field and i think we have discussed enough on these uh, host i mean uh, crop rotations it is a must to have uh, crop rotations especially after main crop uh, don't leave it fallow at least uh, grow and uh, legume crops so that the main reservoir of mln inoculum is uh, completely taken care of so that it will not uh, act as a reservoir for the uh, next crop so wherever you find you know like uh, the suspected plants don't uh, throw here and there and especially it will act as a, a huge reservoir for the uh, the, uh, the existing crops also neighbor crops and also next seasons so we have to be uh, completely incinerate them uh, to the best possible Yeah, that's why I'm coming to the checklist. Can you see the, the yeah? Can you see now? Okay, good. So based on these uh, steps, what we have been uh, recommending, uh, uh, you know, like uh, we have come up with a checklist, so which has been carefully um, executed by uh, several seed companies uh, with the uh, um, you know uh, help of uh, um, agra aatf so this is a checklist is most important to follow first is uh, monitor the crop history and of seed production fields to enable the adequate uh, control plants that is the most important to first step and second step you know like uh, maintain adequate level of soil fertility based on soil test to ensure healthy crops uh, yeah and third step is timely planting uh, to uh, facilitate disease escape and also eliminate disease incidence due to late uh, planted crop and most of the cases you know like uh, the planting is done you know very regularly so that it acts as a reservoir for the next crop that should be avoided the planting should go one in once in a, uh, one uh, particularly one month and should end in one month it should not be done in a regular manner and uh, use of disease free seed stocks is in subsequent seed production is most important to follow there later and then clean farming equipment as i mentioned earlier to remove the contaminated soil debris and minimize the spread of uh, disease from one field to another uh, most importantly people do not uh, you know consider to clean from one field to another so they, they keep carrying the uh, debris from one uh, farm to another that itself is a big source of inoculum and eliminate the grasses as i mentioned earlier not just in the plot but also uh, surrounding to the plot is most important to remove and monitor and control the insect vector population through the tested spraying uh, regions uh, which uh, you are doing uh, most of the times and score for viral symptoms to ensure uh, early detections which are uh, Francis mentioned how to scout and and how to diagnose and rogue out the symptomatic plants and burn and, and incinerate them in a regular manner that in itself is a big uh, step to uh, check the inoculum load and sample suspected plants uh, for the diagnosis testing and especially within the internal quality to confirm the disease pressure and post harvest crop selection is another key steps to follow because uh, uh, you may not know that uh, some of times rotten seeds or uh, infected seeds uh, we, we may add into the maize uh, clean seed uh, uh, bulk so that itself will be a, uh, more uh, contaminating the chances we have to eliminate those chances as well i think as i mentioned crop rotation is must to have with non cereal crops especially uh, one to three seasons depending on the uh, disease history i think that itself will take care of uh, 
larger amount of uh, dyna clumps in the surrounding. So with this, you know, like uh, uh, we have to have a constant watch on this checklist. Not just checklist is in the, uh, available, but one should monitor the checklist periodically, ensure that all the steps is uh, meticulously followed in the field, so that we can produce disease-free seeds in our farm. So some of you are maybe interested in one or two uh, videos, especially on uh, how uh, aphids and, uh, and thrips can if last. on the basis of feeding probes, the aphid has recognized the plant as a suitable host, it typically moves to the underside of the leaf in order to start prolonged feeding. During feeding, the aphid stylet bundle reaches the sieve tubes in which the beet mild yellowing virus is transported in the infected plants. The virus particles are passed through the aphid's food canal along with the sap taken up while sucking upside down into the esophagus, the stomach, and the gut. The virus particles cross the lining of the midgut and in this way enter the aphid's body fluid, its hemolymph. The virus particles circulate in the body cavity without multiplying. On their way, they also reach the principal salivary glands and the neighboring accessory salivary glands through which they enter. These viroliferous aphids transmit the beet mild yellowing virus from plant to plant along with salivary secretions. The aphid often remains a virus vector for life. For this reason, this type of virus transmission is termed persistent. If on the basis of feeding probes, the aphid has recognized the plant as a and they can have a quick uh, note on the thrips. Over the past 25 years, the western flower thrips has spread from its origins in the southwestern parts of the USA to become a major greenhouse pest. The species, with the Latin name Frontliniella occidentalis, is a member of the thrips family. Adults are up to 1.5 millimeters long and prefer to stay concealed, for instance, inside flowers, where they feed on energy-rich pollen. Apart from ornamental plants, the western flower trips also attack many vegetable crops, such as beans, as can be seen here. The mouth parts are designed for piercing and sucking, allowing them to penetrate plant cells and to suck out their contents. Many plant cells are depleted one by one within a restricted area, as shown here, much accelerated. These emptied areas turn pale and are usually covered by dark spots of feces. Severely infested parts of plants can become dehydrated. Frontliniella occidentalis also transmits the economically important tomato-spotted wilt virus. Male western flower trips are smaller than females. After mating, the females use a special ovipositor in order to insert their eggs into the plant tissue. The first stage larvae hatch a few days later and soon start feeding. Here we see the feeding process of such a larva at five times normal speed. Older first stage larvae often live together in small social groups. A few days later, they shed their cuticle and become second stage larvae, which also feed by removing the contents of plant cells. Once these second stage larvae are fully developed, they usually move to the soil for pupation. The molting process to the next stage, the prepupa, is shown here on a leaf. Pre-pupae have small wing stubs and do not feed. Later on, they molt to pupae with much longer wing stubs. Finally, adult trips arise from the pupae. At 20 degrees Celsius, insects take about three weeks to develop from eggs to adults. 
Over 10 generations a year can be produced in the greenhouse. So idea is to share with you that you know one thrips can can have a 10 to 12 life cycle per year. Imagine, so you will have trillions of thrips in your farm. It is unpredictable, you know, like uh, how a tiny insect can transmit to a MCMV. We may look for a bigger insect, but it is notice, unnoticeably the damage will happen. And aphids is also, you can see, it can stay throughout the life cycle. That means that kind of a magnitude of vectors is sufficient to spread the whole diseases. We have to take care of the vector population as equally as important, apart from other source of infection. Yeah. Yeah, Monica, you can ask while uh, I load the presentation of yeah. Dr. Prasanna. Uh, a quick comment more than a question. The checklist that uh, Suresh presented is really very important. And I think that we need to find some time, Lava, today or um, maybe after lunch, I don't know, some time. We need to go through that list a little bit more carefully because it's fundamental for producing and starting and initiating the idea of how to produce a healthy seed. Uh, there are a few questions I have on the list, but we can I can ask them later. But I think, I don't know if Dr. Prasanna agrees, but I think that is very relevant to the, to the um, uh, aim of this uh, workshop. We have time in the afternoon, definitely. Yeah, I think absolutely important, and that needs to be discussed uh, there are two things here. One, uh, in MLN endemic countries, uh, where the seed is being produced, commercial seed is being produced, how to create awareness among those seed producers on keeping their seed production fields clean and ensuring that uh, the seed that is produced is not contaminated uh, with MLN causing viruses. So that's the number one priority because, as I said yesterday, Many of those commercial seed producing countries in Southern Africa, including Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, South Africa, are transporting seed to many countries in Eastern Africa, as well as in West Africa. So we need to ensure that they are the first points of creating awareness about that. Um, ben Lockhart also believes that keeping the soil clean uh, is as important uh, while keeping the plants clean. So both are, I think, uh, important issues to take note of. Um, as of today, of course, West Africa is not really affected. Uh, but therefore, uh, what is really important is to keep that status as such. Uh, and to regularly make the seed companies within Nigeria and in other countries aware about uh, the monitoring and surveillance uh, in their seed production fields. Uh, I think that's something which uh, Monica in the afternoon it has to be discussed and uh, companies need to be uh, educated much more uh, in the region. I mean, many, of the, many of the things that were said is, please come. You know, please come, Prasanna. Many of the things is basic seed hygienic practices, the weed management and all this stuff, especially in the non endemic areas. Uh, we have time again to discuss these things in the afternoon, so we will continue with the next presentation by Dr. Prasanna on breeding for host plant resistance. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lava. Uh, this is uh, the last but one topic, then we have uh, Anne Wangai talking about integrated management of MLN. Uh, breeding for MLN resistance is indeed uh, a very important uh, tool uh, in tackling the MLN challenge. Uh, we all saw yesterday how devastating MLN could be. Um, already the dark clouds are already there in uh, Kenya and in many other countries and hopefully they will not be moving towards other uh, sub-regions. Uh, but within a short period of uh, five years, uh, MLN spread very rapidly. Uh, initially it was concentrated around that blue spot uh, in Kenya. Then it moved uh, with each with each year. It moved to different uh, other countries, including Tanzania, Uganda, DRC, uh, South parts of South Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, and so on. Uh, so this is 
really a very alarming spread. But when it comes to breeding for resistance to diseases like MLN, uh, what do we need to do? Uh, we undoubtedly strongly uh, uh, are aware that use of disease resistant cultivars is indeed the most valuable and practical means to control the disease. Uh, not only in a preemptive way, but also managing wherever it is already prevalent. Secondly, uh, it is an environmentally sustainable, inexpensive, effective, and simple to scale up and uh, deploy over uh, uh, large production areas, uh, because seed can package multiple traits. Uh, that's the beauty of uh, breeding. Uh, but for that to be implemented in a very strong way, there are three major requirements. One, we need to have diverse germplasm uh, that can offer uh, the levels of resistance that we need. Two, we need to have screening tools uh, that can provide us with a reliable understanding of germplasm responses. And third, we need to have test locations uh, that can provide consistently high disease pressure. Uh, with regard to disease resistance, these are general principles, but uh, they are also need to be discussed in terms of MLN. Uh, there are two, two or three different kinds of terminologies that we use. One, immunity. Uh, immunity comes into picture when the pathogen cannot even establish itself uh, due to some strong innate structural or functional properties of the host. Does it exist in case of MLN? No. So far we do not have immune sources of immune sources in case of maize. But there are, all, there are opportunities for resistance. Why do we use this term resistance and tolerance when it comes to MLN? Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, as far as we interpret in terms of CIMIT, uh, for instance, tolerance is the disease is still there. You are still seeing on a one to nine scale, maybe around three, four or five, uh, but not definitely eight or nine uh, where there is complete necrosis. But the damage to the economic produce uh, is hardly 10 to 15 percent or maximum 20 percent compared to the commercial checks, which are 80 to 100 percent vulnerable to the disease. That means if uh, a commercial check is not even yielding one ton per hectare, a, a typical tolerant hybrid that we have is somewhere around three to four tons per hectare uh, under those conditions. But when we talk about resistance, resistance means much higher levels of uh, uh, fight against the disease. In this case, we are not seeing more than uh, on a one to nine scale, not more than two or 2.5. Uh, and then not only the disease severity is severely curtailed, it, the plant looks clean. The most important thing is yield. Uh, yield is not compromised in a big way compared to a, a non-infected uh, control. Uh, an affected, infected control uh, or a hybrid here will not lose more than 5% or 10% maximum uh, under severe disease conditions. Not only that, the third point is the disease titers do not increase significantly. Uh, within, if you, if you monitor the uh, virus inoculum or virus titers here, uh, they don't expand too significantly compared to uh, a, a susceptible control. So these are minor differences when it comes to uh, tolerance or resistance. Mostly, therefore, what we used to have in 2013, 14, 15 are tolerant materials. But what we can confidently say now is that we have indeed resistant germplasm, uh, which on a one to nine scale is not more than 1.5 or two maximum. So you come to Naivasha, you will see a clear difference between what is an MLN resistant hybrid versus a tolerant hybrid and a susceptible hybrid in the same, uh, planted on the same day, inoculated in the same way. What is therefore required for rapidly breeding and deploying? Here the term rapid comes because uh, farmers cannot keep waiting for solution. You do need to deliver those solutions very, very quickly. When it comes to rapid or fast-track breeding and deploying elite disease-resistant cultivars, these are five or six important things that I would like to highlight. One, as I said, genetically diverse germplasm with potential to offer resistance. Two, 
capacity to reliably screen the germplasm, especially under artificial inoculation, not just relying upon natural hot spots, where there can be still possibilities for disease escapes to happen. Third, we need to have a very well-defined germplasm screening protocol, including how to inoculate, how to first of all uh, rapidly multiply the pathogen inoculum, do proper inoculations on the plants, and uh, have a good rating system uh, that is reliable and consistent across different technicians or across different scientists. Uh, not a very subjective, somebody will go and say this is three out of nine. Somebody else will come and say this is six out of nine or five out of nine. That is a very subjective rating system. If your disease breeding has to be really strong, you need to have a very objective and well-defined well rating scale. Four, you also need to deploy novel tools to accelerate the process of breeding and improve your efficiencies and increase genetic gains. What are those tools that we have right now? High throughput phenotyping for MLN. Two, we also have molecular markers for MLN resistance. Third, we also have double haploid technology. I will briefly touch upon this later. All these efforts are one side, effectively deploying the improved seed of those resistant varieties is another side. If you just develop good uh, varieties and keep it on shelf uh, and not deploy them effectively, it's of no use. So varietal release, seed scaling up, and deploying those improved seed to the farmers uh, is really key. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, this is one of the best partnerships we have across Sub-Saharan Africa, the partnership with the Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization. Uh, in fact, I would say without any hesitation, Kenya has indeed best facilities for public sector maize breeding across the developing world. No hesitation in saying that. The reason is simple. Where can you get 100 hectares of drought screening facility. You have it in Kipako. Where can you have 20 hectares of double haploid facility? You have it in Kipako. Where do you have confined field trials for drought tolerance, nitrogen use efficiency? You have it in Kipako. Where do you have state-of-the-art facilities for disease screening? You have it in Naivasha. Can any other country boast of the same? Not even India, I would say. Not even China has a double haploid facility. The first country to have a dedicated public sector maize double haploid facility across the developing world is Kenya. So give a big hand to Kenya. Pardon? Kakamega. We have plenty of other things. Kakamega, Embu, Kitale, you name it, you have one of the strongest public sector breeding efforts in collaboration with CIMIT. So this is the Kalro Naivasha facility where we have set up this 20 hectare dedicated facility. It must be seen to be believed where every plant is challenged by MLN viruses and artificial inoculation and you have clear cut responses uh, in terms of disease resistance or disease vulnerability. And three dedicated screen houses to continuously produce MCMV in one, one screen house, one greenhouse, SCMV in another screen house throughout the year. To be able to inoculate those 17 hectares of uh, uh, open field facility. So this is how it looks like, as I said, that these three facilities are for inoculum generation and these screen houses are for screening for individual viruses like MCMV or SCMV and these 17 hectares uh, are for open field screening for, uh, of maize germplasm against both the viruses. So intensive, that's the second important factor. Capacity to intensively screen large sets of germplasm under artificial inoculation. So CIMIT then mobilized thousands and thousands of germplasm entries from all across the world, including Mexico, uh, and screened them intensively in this facility over the last four years and identified sources of resistance. Initially, when we tested our uh, drought tolerant inbred lines, uh, it was pathetic to see most of our drought tolerant germplasm completely vulnerable. You look at this CML442, 
443, 448, 395, these are some of the most widely used parental lines with drought tolerance in commercial hybrids in sub-Saharan Africa. And they are highly susceptible to MLM. But then over a period of time, we started building up resistance. Uh, and today, we are very proud to have at least 40 to 50 inbred lines with high levels of resistance to MLM. Uh, this has come through very dedicated efforts of our team. And uh, some of them are even exotic sources. For example, KS23 uh, is a cassette at University, Thailand line, which offers excellent protection. But it's an yellow kernel inbred line, not white one. But we have CML574, a cement white line, which offers excellent protection against MLN. So we have now a wide range. I can't even give the list here. But it's not just important to have a good phenotypic score. That means beautiful green plants. We also need to have good yield. So when we test our materials, we also look at what is the response in terms of yield uh, of each of those entries. Uh, look at this MLN resistant hybrid. Absolutely no yield penalty in Naivasha under artificial inoculation. But look at this commercial susceptible check, not even a single year is formed. That means 100% yield loss compared to no yield loss under extreme uh, disease pressure. So this is the effort that has gone in in terms of deriving this large set of genetically diverse MLN tolerant and resistant hybrids, nine of which have already been released. Four are already under seed scale up and deployment. 450 tons of certified seed of three hybrids, Bazooka, H12ML, and Meru HB607 are already being deployed by our seed company partners. Uh, so this is perhaps one of the strongest progress you can ever see uh, against uh, a disease epidemic. What I wanted to see ex actually in Nigeria and in other countries also is a facility like this. You don't have to have a germplasm screening facility because you don't have the disease. But you need to have a quarantine facility like this, an open field quarantine facility that CIMIT has established at the Plant Quarantine Institute at Mazowe in Harare. This is a, a five hectare dedicated facility. It is ring fenced completely, security, 24 hour security within the institution and you can screen the germplasm without any hesitation because not even within the uh, five kilometers periphery there is any commercial seed production field. Uh, when you say screen, what are you screening? These, these materials are coming from Simit Kenya. These are all doubled haploid lines that have come from Simit Kenya. As I said yesterday, after passing through several layers of screening in Nairobi, including seed screening, leaf screening, then kefis screening, then the materials are sent to Mazove. And Mazove, they are produced here like this. Each plot is tested with immunostrips to confirm that there is no MCMV. Then only when you are confirming that there is no MCMV, you are selfing the plants and then multiplying the seed. So the capacity to screen here is at least 20,000 entries. Right? I just want to clarify, because screening it gives a wrong sense of uh, understanding. Here, basically, this is a kind of a virus-free seed multiplication plot. And the screening you're doing is a kind of a, another round of backup check just to Exactly, sure that, to ensure yeah. that there is no there MCMV is, introduced yeah. in Zimbabwe. But basically, this is the primary seed production field introduced from the Kenya. And then you harvest the seed, and then you take it out of the but, control. But area. this is under quarantine conditions. Because there is no, not everybody can enter into this. It's not like a day-to-day -day seed production field. It's a quarantine block with no maize that is sown, commercial maize in the peripheries, at least in two to five kilometers. It is managed by the quarantine research station. CIMIT provides the technical backstopping in terms of checking the status of MCMV in each and every plot ensuring that there is not just phenotypic lack of phenotypic symptoms but lack of virus and then multiplying the seed and distributing to partners so now this is the 
first receiving point for the seed coming exactly. out of the endemic areas. And if as long as the seed is further distributed, sourced from this zone, yeah. there is little risk. It doesn't require that the seed has to go through the same level of. We need this kind of quarantine facility. Exactly. That's provided the, that's the, the point. seed is coming from, endemic the tested seed is coming from the endemic. The facility that we are trying to establish now in uh, Nigeria is similar to, to enable the research scale. Uh, we are not planning the same level of seed production. Yeah, but my point here is each country needs to have such kind of a quarantine seed block. The reason is simple. We want to capacitate the national programs to pick up the best materials coming from any country and to use it in breeding programs. Otherwise, how will you fast track preemptive breeding. So the, the point here is uh, each country, not just Nigeria, each country in West Africa where there is a, a good breeding program to have such a, you, you may not have a five hectare facility, but at least establish a one acre facility or a two acres facility. Okay? That is important. Now, th is this not wonderful? There is nothing more beautiful than maize in this world. Right? <laughs> okay, these are all Mexican maize land races. These Mexican maize land races come in diverse forms, diverse shapes, diverse colors, from the smallest to the largest. Can anybody tell me, other than my Simit colleagues, what is this land race? An instant price, if you can tell the name of this land race. Instant price. Uh, hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, I am hundred percent sure. Other than my Smith colleagues, this is called hala maize. J A L A. Yeah, it is a hala maize. Hala maize is the world's longest maize. World's longest means how much? Forty-five to sixty centimeters year. Forty-five to sixty centimeters year. And it is grown in some provinces in Mexico. Every year there is a competition among the farmers who grows the longest hala maize. And they measure it and then award the farmer. So the reason why I am talking about this diversity is maize has one of the strongest diversities in the tropical and subtropical germplasm. And Simit Germplasm Bank at Mexico holds nearly 27,000 land race accessions. And this provides a veritable treasure trove for fishing out diversity for a number of traits, including drought tolerance, disease resistance, nitrogen or other use efficiencies. So important for a breeding program is access to diversity and to retain this diversity and to use this diversity in a very functional way. Anyway, sorry for losing out on the hundred dollars, but <laughs> okay, what, uh, what Monica and Terry have done uh, very, very importantly, when, when we realized that the sources of resistance to MCMV are not much, we started exploring at CIMIT, Mexico, thousand accessions have been initially screened, uh, not at Kenya, sorry, this should be CIMIT, Mexico, under controlled conditions. And from this, 20 land races accessions with putative sources of MCMV tolerance or resistance identified, like this. And this is within the land race. Land race is genetically heterogeneous. That means you have different genotypes within a single land race. Some could be resistant, some could be susceptible. So you take further selections out of this, then you cross it with an adopted uh, inbred line like CML, 494, 550, 537, 549, derive material, segregating families out of this, and then check for resistance. This is called pre-breeding. That means you are transferring a useful trait from an unad unadopted or exotic germplasm into cultivated maize genetic backgrounds. That's one way of fast tracking or diversifying or broadening the genetic base for resistance. Now I am talking about accelerating breeding for resistance. How do we accelerate breeding? The first important thing is you need to move from a typical visual subjective scoring to an objective-based scoring. 
Objective based scoring it can be done for diseases also, like through what we call canopy digital imaging. So we have we have drones that can go around our research block at a short height, around 20 feet, 30 feet, capture images uh, of the entire block. In fact, uh, this particular slide is a drone-based image. This is taken by a drone, but the drone can fly at a, even at a much uh, shorter heights and then capture images. And these images are then processed digitally and their correlation with the manual or visual scoring is checked. And that's what we did in collaboration with University of Barcelona uh, recently. This is called RGB-based imaging. And it provides an excellent, uh, you can clearly see here the, the leaves that have been completely necrotic, that means they are finished, the plant is finished, versus something which has retained a few areas of green, something which has retained even smaller area of green, and you can clearly correlate this visual RGB-based image scores with the manual scores. So within, within uh, one hour, you can complete the entire 17 hectares block and convert it into images, and the images into scores. That's the beauty of modern day high throughput field-based phenotyping. The second important area is markers. You can detect genomic regions that, convert, that uh, confer resistance to diseases like MLM. This is what Manja Gowda, uh, my colleague here in Simit, Nairobi did. Uh, he evaluated several association mapping panels, identified genomic regions for MLM resistance, validated them in several biparental populations. Now we have a list of 12 to 15 SNPs or molecular markers especially from chromosome 3, 6, and 9. These together explain a high percent of phenotypic variation. And then what we did, we systematically used these molecular markers to transfer resistance from other donors into cultivated, uh, the parental lines of cultivated hybrids. So that's what we did, the chrom chromosome uh, region on 6, genomic region on chromosome 6, consistently reduced the MLN score. And then we did marker-assisted back crossing over a large number of Africa adopted lines, 24 lines in one cohort and another 20 lines in another cohort. And these are now ready for deployment. That means resistant versions of highly popular susceptible drought-tolerant lines. And then, in collaboration with Pioneer, we are embarking now on a very exciting project, actually cloning this gene from chromosome 6. What is this gene actually doing uh, on chromosomes? Why is it having such a huge effect on MLN resistance, especially when it comes from KS23 background? And we will be going for genome editing or gene editing in that particular gene uh, so that what is the advantage of gene editing? You don't have to go through four or five years of marker-assisted breeding. Within two seasons, you can convert a susceptible line into a resistant version within two crop seasons. So that is the beauty of gene editing. You are not introducing any transgene here. You are simply making those alterations within the gene that is responsible for susceptibility and converting it into a resistance gene. Isn't that beautiful? So that is genome editing or gene editing. So through that, you can just convert a CML395 into a resistant version within just two crop seasons. This is nothing to do with the transgenic technology. Uh, it is just editing of a natural gene. And. Uh, you, you, we can now see this extensive fine mapping population. Wherever this KS23 favorable allele is there, all the plants are showing beautiful resistance. Wherever there is segregation that is plus and minus for that QTL, you can see some plants which are resistant and some plants devastated by the disease. That means perfect segregation for favorable allele and non-favorable allele or unfavorable allele.
This is the first step before we go for uh, fine mapping. This is called fine mapping. And through that fine mapping, we go as close to the gene as possible, then fish out the gene, understand what is the polymorphism that is leading to resistance, and then go for gene editing. The third most important technology to fast track breeding is this double haploid technology, which reduces the entire process of inbred line derivation from five to six years to just one year. That is called double haploid technology. 100% homozygous lines within just one year. And this is that state of the art double haploid facility at uh, Kibako in Kenya, uh, which today, as of today, we have capability to produce, and we do produce 70,000 maize DH lines each year in Africa adopted genetic backgrounds. 70,000 DH lines. And uh, these are, this particular facility is not just for CIMIT. We offer this DH development service to partners, including IITA, including CALRO, including many other public and private sector partners. Final piece in the puzzle, how do we actually take up these varieties and release to the farmers? In the past, people used to measure their own success by how many crop varieties we have generated and released. So breeders used to put in their CV, <laughs> curriculum vitae, these many varieties I have released. Today, the question is about not how many varieties you have released, but what impact these varieties have made in the farmer's fields, the demonstrated impact. And if you have to have a demonstrated impact, you need to have four important factors. Identify easy to produce hybrids. Two, accelerate the release of these new varieties. Third, partnership with the seed companies so that you can rapidly scale up this seed and deliver it to the farming communities. Fourth, you need to have a high varietal replacement or varietal turnover frequency. Replace those old, obsolete, climate vulnerable, disease susceptible varieties with those MLN resistant, drought tolerant, striga tolerant varieties. The sooner we do this, the better. In India, typically a good hybrid does not last for more than five to seven years. Five to seven years is the typical lifespan in India for a good hybrid from public or private sector. US, it is again almost the same, maybe even a little lesser than India. Do you know what is the average lifespan of a variety in Africa? 18 to 20 years. And sometimes in some crops it can go much beyond that. It can be even 30 years, 40 years, varieties lasting. How long does Obatampa last? Obatampa, 40 years. It is still grown in many countries across the world, uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa. It's not that we don't have varieties that can potentially replace Obatampa. It's just the question of driving the seed systems, driving the companies, driving those partners to replace those old, four decades old varieties with something that can match that variety in terms of nutritional profile and better in terms of stress resilience. So this is the major mantra. Mantra is a gospel in India. So mantra for seed systems is varietal replacement or varietal turnover frequency. So for that, you need to create, stimulate demand. What we did in the last two, three years is extensive on-farm demos of those MLN resistant varieties in Eastern Africa. Look at the number of on-farm demos that have been done for bazooka by Nasako in Uganda, creating that, that awareness to the farming communities that here is a drought tolerant and MLN tolerant hybrid. And that's why within one year, we went all the way from zero to 500 tons, 500 tons. H12 ML, similarly, by, by KSC, Kenya Seed Company in Kitale. So they haven't reached the same stages as, as Kenya, but they are now extensively producing basic seed and certified seed in Kenya under disease-free zones. Otherwise, their lot will be rejected by KFIS. 
and H12ML is the same story that is happening. So I would like to thank uh, all the donors, especially Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, Syngenta Foundation, CRP Mays, my CIMIT and IITA colleagues for the wonderful partnership uh, and for the dedication to the mission and most importantly, partners, CALRO, EIR, uh, NARO Uganda, many others who could be potential partners with CIMIT and our present partners with CIMIT and IITA here. The mantra here is take the improved seed that is already available, implement fast track breeding, and deploy those MLN resistant varieties to your farming communities as quickly as possible. Don't wait for the disease to come to this region. Thank you so much. Any one or two questions? Um, uh, Dr. Lava, who know the sentiments around here in Nigeria. I want you just to help us in maybe a few words. What are the different methods you use in the uh, resistance varieties for MLN, MNA, and the GMO production? Thank you. Yeah, all the hybrids that I talked about, all the spectrum of hybrids that we have developed so far, none of them have GMO trait. We don't need GM would try to fight against MLN, to be very frank with you. Within four or five years, we demonstrated what conventional breeding and marker-assisted breeding can do. So forget about genetically modified sources for MLN resistance. Uh, somebody challenged me in 2012, Prasanna, if you can get MLN resistance without using GM, I will give you a bottle of champagne. And I got that bottle of champagne from that person in US. I showed him what we could do. So therefore, just forget about, as far as MLN resistance is concerned, we have sources of resistance, and we are capable of breeding very fast new improved varieties with MLN resistance. No issue. Thank you, President. In the interest of time, I. Okay, yes, well, one I, two. I can't, yeah. I can't uh, say no to that. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Can we say the same thing? Uh, just that statement you said about MNL. Can we say the same thing about uh, Polamiwa? Hmm. This is a tough question. For diseases, yes, we, we can find resistance. And even for Polamiwa, as I showed yesterday, there are conventional sources of resistance to Polamiwa. It's not that we need only GM, but GM to me, GM-based resistance is one of the tools in the toolbox. So if countries are not willing to take up GM-based transgenic resistance against fall warm, you may still have conventional hybrids or conventional varieties with fall warm resistance. That is possible. But in countries like South Africa, where there is already willingness to adopt a transgenic technology, there is no harm in going for a new transgene, which is already being deployed, MON89034, uh, which is obtained under humanitarian license. Humanitarian license means the company, Monsanto here, has given that particular transgene without charging any royalty. That, that is important, otherwise, you, the cost of your transgenic hybrid will be almost double compared to what you are selling for a conventional hybrid. So through the VEMA project, what we did, we negotiated with Monsanto and we had humanitarian license for the transgene. So if companies are willing to test transgenics, it's a one of the tools against fall uh, I have, I am not wedded to any technology, but my, my approach is very pragmatic. Adopt all possible tools in the toolbox and see what works best under which situation. So if GM, if the country is willing, our CIMIT policy is very simple. I am sure it's the same policy for IATA. The willingness should come from the country itself. It's not that we are going to force any X, Y, and Z country. 
to take up or not to take up transgenics. We will provide all possible information. It's for the country to decide. If the country says, like Ethiopia is now saying, we want the transgene against falam Ivan resistance under humanitarian license, we will negotiate with Monsanto and get it. But if some other country says, no, I don't want any transgenic, I want only conventionally derived resistance, no problem. You will still have some other options. I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much, Prasanna. So, since we have to, there is another session happening here in uh, conference center. Okay. We need to leave okay. at 1.10 latest. So, I would call uh, Dr. Anne Van Gai to present the last talk. And, uh, and uh, uh, please, before the presentation, I will advise all our students and, uh, and uh, staff who are here, you can go for your lunch now. Thank you very much. Now, my presentation is on IPM, Management of Maize Lethal Necrosis, and uh, quite a lot of what I had prepared has already been given uh, by the, my, the previous speakers, and uh, so in my presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce what we mean by disease occurrence or and the factors that affect the disease occurrence. And uh, also I'm going to briefly explain what IPM strategy is about. And uh, I'll talk on disease spread expression and also the, uh, dwell on the approaches towards management of MLN. But as I have said, I would skip through most of this briefly so I'll be very brief because quite a lot of what I had has already been mentioned by the previous speakers. Now when we are talking about uh, the IPM approach, we are really talking about an approach that focuses on long-term prevention of all pests or diseases and their damage that comes through uh, that is uh, achieved through the application of a uh, combination of techniques. So really the key word here is combination of the techniques, that's the integration of uh, the techniques that are available to be able to lower the disease or uh, the pest level. And uh, also IPM, focuses and minimizes on reducing or minimizing hazards that would be, uh, can be to human health and environment and non-target organisms. And uh, that, um, that means also that uh, pesticides are still part of the, can be used as part of the IPM, but uh, they would be used only when monitoring after disease, uh, confirming the presence of the, uh, the organism that is to be uh, managed, and also the f it should be applied judicia judiciously and uh, only affecting the target organism. Uh, when we are talking about disease presence or disease epi uh, uh, and a disease epidemic, there are three factors that need to be considered. As one, having the susceptible host, and uh, in the case of MLN, we have heard uh, from uh, Dr. Prasanna that we currently, yes, they are, re uh, they are varieties that are already have already been developed 
that have some quite high level of tolerance to the disease, but not none that are have got immunity to the disease, meaning there is a small level of susceptibility that would be in those uh, uh, varieties. And then there is the factor, or the other factor is the pathogen itself, the presence of the virus. We know the MCMV virus is there, is very virulent, and will therefore uh, attack the crop that does not have a total immunity. We also know that there is conducive environment in the areas where the disease is occurring. So since we have those, the existence of both the susceptible hosts uh, at uh, various uh, tolerance levels, and also we have a virulent pathogen and, uh, epidium and uh, an environment that is favorable to the pathogen, then we are, we would be having the disease. But when it comes now to IPM, this is where now the approach, the IPM approach, where you look at the disease, the, in where the inter, it, there can be interception at the, either the, at the host level or at the, vir uh, the pathogen level, or even at the environment. And I'm going to discuss uh, uh, very quickly some of those interceptions levels. And uh, for that, the fact that uh, we are seeing they are the, we are dealing with the host, the pathogen, and also the environment, that calls for a concerted effort from multidisciplinary teams and uh, in at the uh, if I were to draw experience from the Kenya situation we had uh, this kind of a uh, teamwork amongst multidisciplinary and multi institutional teams that uh, to be able to have an IPM kind of approach of uh, management of uh, MLN and those are uh, teams from the government organizations, international research organizations, private sector in the Kenya, all based in Kenya, and then we had international collaborators. So I have all those in the list there. Now, when the disease occurred, this was the situation at the farmer's field and uh, the, at the individual level of the plants, those are the symptoms that were being observed. And uh, now we ha there was the, the infected plant showing very different symptom, you know, different uh, expression from the healthy plant. But now to be able to go to get and modify or, and get the, reduce the infestation of the disease, the, the two approaches were, uh, were, impl were implemented in Kenya, the first one being the modification of cultural practices, and the second one, the, the habitat uh, manipulation. And uh, the first one was the synchronizing of, early, of uh, planting within the regions and making sure that the farmers were planting quite early in the maize crop. By doing this, the farmer, the crop that was planted early escaped infestation of uh, the heavy infestation of the vectors as well as the disease. Whereas the late planted crop was, would always be observed to be very severely uh, aff uh, affected by the disease. Also, the farmers were, have been uh, have been advised to use certified seed, and uh, for this, from uh, renowned uh, stockists and also from companies, and this on the for the certification part of it, uh, the regulatory body, CAFIS in Kenya has now continued 
more, uh, checking and uh, for the virus for MCMV and ensuring that only what has got zero level of MCMV can pass through. There is zero tolerance for MCMV in all the seed maize. And uh, after that, the farmers are being encouraged to monitor and drug out all infected crop in their farms uh, as early as uh, at germination stage so that then those uh, infected plants don't act as the source of inoculum for the vir for the uh, for the vectors that would be around and so that, that the disease does not spread out in the field. Also, the farmers are being advised to avoid the staggering or overlapping of crop of maize, especially in the areas where they have adequate rainfall throughout the year. This is uh, an example of one farm where the farmer has got three crops at different stages that they are planted deliberately because that is what the fam family uses as its food. All the time there is red maize in the crop. That now is being discouraged because the, pe the disease mo is moving from the oldest crop to the younger crop and to the youngest crop so that throughout the season, throughout the year, there would be the disease and it would also spread to the other farmers. One key point about these uh, measures is that it's we are encouraging farmers to join into groups, into communities, because if you have one farmer practicing this, it's going to affect all the other farmers, so that they can agree, yes, this is where we are, when we are going to plant, and we start planting at the onset of the main, main rains, we start planting, and that way everybody will be safe and uh, they continue. And then also there is, Dr. Prasanna has talked about use of resistant varieties where they are available, and I will not dwell on that. We are also talking about introduction of a uh, season that is maize free. That is to break the continuous maize grow, uh, growing of maize throughout the season. And uh, that break, does not mean that there will not be any crop. That's when to plant another crop that is not a cereal-based uh, crop. We had an interesting uh, scenario in Kenya where farmers, uh, after harvesting maize, they planted sorghum. And uh, that really was beating, you know, defying the purpose altogether. But uh, if they could uh, grow uh, non cereal crops such as uh, legumes, beans, or even vegetables, cabbages, it uh, would help. Another scenario that came up is that uh, in one area, there was total resistance of the farmers. They said, no, cabbages, beans, those are women's crop. This is an area that uh, they grow maize as a cash crop, and it is a men-only crop, because it is a cash crop. So there were a lot of politics and other social issues that came in. But now the rivers has turned out in that area. Actually, it is Bomet, where this disease started in Kenya. Now, maize is a woman's crop. Cabbages are a man's crop. Because it is fetching even better returns in the market than the, than the maize. So we also have to ensure that there is crop diversification to ensure food security, because at the end of the day, what matters is that the, farm, the farmer has got some food to put onto the table. It doesn't matter whether it is sweet potatoes or is cassava. It, rather than planting maize after maize, and the crop is being destroyed by the disease. And now we are getting that uh, acceptance from some farmers in some pockets in Kenya. Others, they still work in progress. And then we also have to, there has to be restriction of movement. As soon as the disease is found in an area, the restriction of the maize stalks and the green cobs, because with movement of that crop 
from one area to the other, if it is from an infected area, then you are actually spreading the vectors and the disease. Um, when it comes to habitat uh, manipulation, we are talking about removal of infected material. And uh, like uh, this scenario here in this farmer's field, the farmer had really very, uh, the crops started, ended up to be so poor we had to try to tell the farmer no because of the frequent rogging and uh, there were, eventually the, there was hardly any maize left. So they, we are uh, telling them because their crop season was not over, they had to plant some beans in between so that they can have a crop at the end of the season. And similarly, this farmer, we found that he had actually only those two, and there were sickly plants. And the neighbor also had a sickly, plant, uh, a sickly crop. And uh, so that's the time why we are advocating so much of having another crop and skipping maize altogether, rather than having crop like this. Uh, for the, what we call destruction of the infected plants, that is still very controversial even in Kenya because burning uh, uh, straws or stalks of maize is seen as a very wasteful process, especially since uh, most farmers rely on the stalks of maize to feed their animals. And uh, right now we are, uh, the proposal is that if the crop is not looking really bad, the farmers can actually bring in their animals and they feed them there. The, the, farmer, uh, the animals come and feed on the crop when it is still in place, not removing the crop and taking it out. And uh, rather than the farmer losing double toys, lose on the crop and lose on the, what he was anticipating as the fodder crop. They, if one doesn't have the, any animals, then they can dig a hole and bury it. Because uh, burning sometimes is not the most environmental friendly uh, activity. Uh, we are also at asking farmers to avoid growing within close proximity the grass family uh, crop. And especially when the we in Kenya we have farmers growing napier grass, we um, within amongst the uh, or as a border rows to the uh, maize crop, and uh, we have uh, seen that there is MCMV is going into the napier grass. We already know that there is there are several strains. Uh, I saw this so for sugarcane mosaic going into napier grass also. So napier grass, some varieties of sorghum are also very susceptible to MCMV and sugarcane is also susceptible to MCMV. And uh, we are asking farmers to practice good agricultural practices that is uh, weeding timely and also removing the weeds uh, that are there. It doesn't matter whether they are grass family or whether they are just the broadleaf uh, weeds because we have found that some of the vectors of the MCMV actually are harbored in the broad uh, leaf families. The three, those strips, they are actually, they can exist or uh, exist on the cereal crop as well as on the broadleaf uh, uh, crop. Also, when we are talking, the disease expression, MCMV, MLN, is uh, stronger, especially when the crop is having, is growing where the soil fertility is low and when there is drought, then you see the symptoms very, very strongly. So it is important to ensure that the, the soil fertility, the, the fertilizer application is done as, as recommended, and where possible, 
that uh, the crop is getting enough moisture. So in brief, uh, in short, uh, what we are talking about is that they are, at this moment it is important to pick one or two, if not all, the approaches that can be implemented in, uh, in order to manage the MLN disease. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam. Is there any burning question? Just one, because of our time. So that we can ask. Comment. Comment. Okay. I just wanted to find out in those areas where I think you said in Kenya, where there's resistance to feeding the the livestock with the infected materials. Uh, the livestock is it free range or they are enclosed? Because I'm aware, maybe it may not be reported that when livestock feed on these infected materials and go round and feed on other crops, they could actually transmit these diseases, even though it may not have been re uh, reported as a channel of uh, transmission. So what yeah. do you say, what would you advise? Would you say they should dry, maybe before feeding on livestock? It's something that we have to look at. I totally agree with you. This needs to be looked at closely because uh, the theory that is there is that uh, by the f when the animals are moving from field to field, their dung may be having the virus. That is still not proven, but uh, it is not an impossible thing. But uh, we are also looking at an area, at a time and place where the animals are dying because there is drought. And you are telling the farmer to burn the crop, it will not happen, even if you advise them not to. We also know that we are also talking, here we are talking about the, real, the reality on the ground. We are talking about the areas where farmers grow the crop, and then immediately after that, they, after the harvest, they push in their animals into the field to eat uh, our feed on the uh, stove there. You are going to, going to advise them not, that not to take the animals there is not going to happen. So let's, we need to be realistic and at the same time come up with scientific data that can support that. Right now we don't have scientific data to support that. But we are telling the farmers, yes, don't move from farm to farm. But for your own farm, since it's already infected, take your animals to the farm, let them feed, and then maintain them within your own paddocks. Not, we are not talking about farmers bringing in and then moving to, from farm to farm, but within their own paddocks. And for them, you know, many farmers have got a, Piece, small parcels of land, not to move the infected material from one parcel of land to take them to feed them in the animals in another parcel of land, because that would be transferring the disease. Yeah. Maybe then, one uh, suggestion. Maybe probably we can give the best practices of, of all uh, this one wherever it is possible so that people can think of options, best options. Wherever there is limitations, we can help them to the, do achieve the best one. We cannot rule out that uh, this is the not best, this is the best, but give them the best everything, so they can do the, whatever the best they can afford to do. So thank you very much, madam. I think, uh, please, very snappy, because uh, we are expecting people here. In your presentation, you said we can decompose infected plants by digging a portion of the farm and uh, decompose the infected plants there. But we have been told here that MCMV can survive in the infected plants, in the, I mean in the soil. So if we decompose now, are you sure we are getting rid of that virus completely? Uh, now, when we are talking about uh, digging a hole, 
you dig some a hole and you you dump it in there because uh, other, rather than leaving it uh, leaving the infected plant uh, the stove scattered on the ground where you are going to actually plant but we have also some we have there is work going on which will be able to tell us very clearly for how long you need to you can leave the stove and it will not uh, affect the next crop right now there is the advice that two to three months would be okay but it is not yet proven um please are you i know you have a lot of questions now but we are asked to leave here in 10 minutes please can you meet madam after this and make some clarification okay so thank you yeah. uh, i think it's time for us now to go for lunch and uh, before then i want to find out the technical people in our midst that want to come for cdr testing we want to know the number now so that we can plan how many people want to come for the cdr testing the cdr testing in the afternoon Okay, I think we can still manage this number. That is fine. Please, after the lunch, just remain where you are, then I will lead you from there to the lab. So, uh, the rest participant, you can help yourself and uh, keep yourself busy after the lunch. In case you want a room where you can sit, then uh, the big room where we have the seminar yesterday, we can use that. Place. But there is no activity except for the seated testing in the afternoon. You said? Use your... The last activity is only six testing? Yes, in the afternoon. Okay. Only six day testing in the afternoon. Then uh, the other aspect of it is uh, the interception. How do you identify and all the rest of it? So we do it at 4.30. If we cannot complete it in the morning tomorrow, we will do the completion. If you want to be... It's a voluntary thing. Anybody want to be part of it? That, that's what I was asking. Thank you.